So our Radio 710, the talk of New York. And here's Gene Shepard. That, uh, you know, that uh, statement there. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what, whether I should uh, be bugged or not. I just don't know. I mean, I, I uh, uh, one doesn't tell army stories. One recounts slices of a misspent life. That's not <laughs> the same thing, you know. <laughs> now, I must say this, though, that that the that the, the, the reason that people like army stories, almost all the great literature of the past, maybe you don't think of it this way, but it's interesting to to, to you know, to conjure up the thoughts. Is so is so much of the great literature of the past has been based on uh I don't want to say the word warfare, but army and that life. Uh have you noticed that one of the longest running series on television. You can't, you can hardly turn on TV without seeing it. It's this thing uh, with Bob Crane in it, uh, Hogan's Heroes. I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. Nobody talks about it. It just keeps going on and on and on. Now, wh- why? I don't know why. I mean, it's just there. It's, uh, there must be a lot of psychological reasons. Nash. Uh, this is another one. It goes on and on. Uh, but the, it, it, and, and are any of these anything like the true army experience, of course not. There is nothing like it. Uh, uh, Nash was nothing like any army anybody's ever been in. And uh, do you agree with that? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a TV army, <laughs> and uh, and yet there are elements. And uh, and I, I suppose uh, I might as well. Uh, the other night I was watching uh, television, for example, and, and uh, I, I occasionally watch television as a pure uh, scientific. Uh, Experiment. I can't stand cross naturally. I cannot tolerate the watching this uh, boob medium. But uh, nevertheless, as a you know, after all, a student of uh, sociology must constantly walk around and observe what the people are doing, right? This is the same thing that that reverend said up in Montreal, uh, the one who was caught with 1,700 million feet of uh, pornographic films, 12,000 pornographic books, five million. Uh, pornographic pictures, and he was caught with all this in his apartment. And uh, when apprehended, he said, I have to know what evil is before I can uh, thunder against it. Well, after all, this is not... <laughs> you know, this could be carried to a pretty interesting logical conclusion. But uh, I, I was watching this, this is a boob tube, you know, and there, there was this uh, this movie on, and this movie had, uh, had uh, some of my favorite army people James Whitmore. I don't, I don't know how many years James Whitmore. James Whitmore, you can tell, 
You can tell when the movie was made by what rank Whitmore is. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can remember when Whitmore was playing, P, you know, PFCs and stuff. But then, of course, later he became admiral and general, all that stuff. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, that's a, that's an interesting thing as an actor after, after having spent four years as an enlisted man. Uh, one of the great moments in my life came that in a play I was in here in New York uh, back in the late fifties. I I played a role one brief moment when I came out. This was played many parts, by the way, in this particular this particular play. But this one moment was a great feeling of satisfaction. I came out wearing the authentic full dress pink of a four star general of the infantry. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's a great feeling. Right? I mean, uh, uh, you walk out and, and, and you, you, you actually, you know, you actually begin to feel that you are. You know, it's funny what a uniform will do to you. You have no idea. Uh, you know, George Ade had a great had a great motto: uh, get a good costume, and the part plays itself. I'm telling you, you go you go down to Brooks Brothers and get yourself a good lieutenant colonel's uniform made, and you wear it around the house for a while. And pretty soon, you're you're uh, you're issuing memos. And uh, <laughs> you really are. And, and it's, a, it's a curious feeling. But nevertheless, I, I being in the uh, you know in the army for a while, I've, uh, a lot of things happen to you in the army, in any of the armed services. Much your your life is not boring. It, it never. No, anybody who tells you it's boring in the army, is, his head is asleep. It's one thing it ain't. Uh, it's twelve million other things, but not boring. Uh, it, it's infuriating half of the time. It's. Uh, it's many other things, but boring, it can't be boring because there's always a sense of uncertainty. There's <laughs> always a sense that any minute now, some unbelievably obscene thing is going to happen. How can you be bored, you know? To me, to me, paradise is boring. Uh, the army is not boring, so at least to me. But nevertheless, I'm watching the late movie scene. Odd comes a bunch of typical movie type soldiers, and it's, one of them was Rip Horn. And a couple of guys, you know, yeah, he's always a peer. <laughs> he's always uh, infantry, yard bird, dog face, whatever you prefer to call it. So uh, I, I watch the scene, and they are being picked for a secret mission. You know? They don't know anything about what it is. And the, the uh, lieutenant is walking up and down the platoon, and he's picking these guys for a secret mission. And that was the opening of the film. I said, well, it's a secret mission. They never show the real secret missions. The secret missions that they... Were you ever picked for a secret mission? Well, you're listening to a guy who was. And it was a fascinating secret mission. Do you want to hear about it? Now it can be told, right? <laughs> now it can be told. That uh, before... And I, this is this tonight show is about an army story, and it's a secret mission. And this is a... You know, it's, it's the difference between reality... I'm fascinated constantly by it, like Pirandello, the difference between reality and myth. In other words, the difference between how we see ourselves in literature and how it really is in life. That fascinates me, constantly does. And, and you just don't see the real army, ever. I, I've never seen even brief minutes, many seconds of the real army in, in, uh, in films or TV. Have you ever really? I don't know why. It's just not there. First of all, guys don't talk the way they talk in movies. And in films. I never once, in all the years I was in the Army, did any guy ever take out his wallet and show me a picture of his girl. And that's happening all the time. <laughs> in film. I, I, I never, and I began to feel, I remember one time sitting in a, in a Quonset hut with a bunch of yard birds, say, well, oh, sitting there, Company K is, being given a lecture on how to do right face or something, and, you know, and after three years in the army, you know how to do it pretty good. So you, you know, the lecture gets to be kind of boring. That's a, it's not the army life that's boring. It's some of the things that happen in it that are. And so the, the guy that's given the lecture is bored. The guy that's taking the role is bored. Everybody's bored because everybody knew what they had to do it because every six months you had to have a lecture about this. So we're sitting in this Quonset hut and it's hotter than hell, and, and we're all wearing wearing. The, the prescribed uniform of the day, which happened to be a helmet, uh, helmet, GI shorts, and shoes. That was it. 
and you brought your own heat rash if you wanted to. So we're all sitting there, and and the guy's up there talking away, and he says, I want all of you guys to know that uh, the nomenclature of the M1 uh, it's the exact way we got it in the book. Now, you'll notice the spring lock is number 417. Now, you'll have Zebra. He's going on and on. It's one of these things, nomenclature, operation, maintenance, care and repair of the M1 semi-gas-operated GI issue rifle, right? So you see, so you, 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 I can, I can, you're listening to a guy, but even at this point, I can assemble in my sleep, if, if, if I have to, at least six different types of GI equipment, including the, the carbine... <laughs> You know that nice little guy. That's a beauty. The carbine, the uh, the forty-five caliber uh, sidearm. Uh, the uh, oh, I can go on. The fifty caliber. Uh, well, did you ever do the fifty caliber? That's a goodie. Uh, the big fifty caliber, uh, the, uh, air-cooled. Uh, oh, that's a that's, that's something else. But anyway, I get you yeah, get into that. That's technical. I know who cares. And anyway, we're sitting in this in this quiet side. When all of a sudden, Gas is sitting next to me. He says, uh, Shepard, and I said, yeah, Gas. He says, you know, I wonder how it would feel to be in the real army. I said, what do you mean? Ah. It's that movie we saw last night. That those guys are in the army. We were all seeing movies about the army. You ever see those service movies? You ever see them? I said, well, what do you mean, Gas? He said, well... Well, he said, I'm going to do something. Watch this. And he reaches in his pocket and takes out his wallet. And he says, I ain't even got a picture of a girl. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. And, and, and movies are always saying, hey, would you guys like to see a picture of my girl? And they whip it out. There's always a guy from Brooklyn. You know he's going to get killed. Any guy that shows somebody a picture of his girl, he's going to get killed. This is automatic, right? Okay? And if there's a guy in the squadron or in the squad or the platoon who's black, he's going to save Pat Hingle and or slash Rip Torn and or slash, you know, I know all these things. But in real life, it doesn't happen. It simply doesn't. So we're, we're sitting there one day, and, and it was this quiet night in the, in the tent. Now, we're out, remember, this is, this is active duty. This is not training. So okay, you think this is not, we're sitting in this tent, and the rain is coming down. We are off duty. That's a joke. You're never off duty. We're sitting in the tent and the rain is coming down. And um the guy sticks his head in. He says, hey, he says, uh, he said, hey, Elkins, Shepard, hey, Bob, what you guys here? Are you guys doing anything? He looks up, you know. You know obviously, we're not doing anything. Gas is sitting there, you know, looking at his shoe, and I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there, you know, looking off into the middle distance. Elkins is doing what he endlessly did. He's cleaning his belt. Endlessly, and uh, Alfred, he, 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 when a question like that is asked, you are very suspicious for starters. You don't say, "No, no, we're not." Uh, what do you got in mind? You know, nothing like that. No way. So, uh, uh, Alfred says, uh, mm, "Yeah." <laughs> so, so this, this, this uh, corporal says, "All right, he says, you guys, come on down to the oily room." <laughs> so about. Ten of us start drifting on down. He's going to one tent to the other, see? And the next thing you know, there's about ten of us that are dragging down in the early room. And we get into the early room, which was just another tent, actually. And the rain was still raining on that. You know, it kind of surprised you to discover that the rain comes down on the offices, too, you know? So we go into the tent, the rain is coming down. <laughs> we start milling around. And out of the back of the tent, now before I tell you this story, we better do a few goodies. This is WOR New York. This is a good story, so don't leave. You know, okay, gang. You know this film, of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for some school locally to make this their school song. <laughs> Yeah, with so many new kinds of tires coming out, maybe you're puzzled about making the right choice. Well, surprise, a solution. It's your general tire specialist who's trained to handle all your tire needs. And automotive service problems, too. He'll do everything for you. So if you need new tires, you'll be glad to explain which general tire is best for you. The way you drive, you know, the way you bump into curbs and hit fire plugs and stuff in your budget. Your general tire specialist is one reason why, sooner or later, you will own generals. Phil McConkey. See him out in Jamaica. Yeah. You'll own generals. 
Well, this is one of my favorites. Time for the following political announcement. A lot of PP. Go in and see your local New York, New Jersey, or Fairfield County Jackson dealer. Yeah. All right, let's get down with the story. But uh, nevertheless, now you want to, what, wait, want me to tell you? The, oh, you want me to tell that story? All right, I was trying to avoid it because an unpleasant situation has developed. Nevertheless, we, you know, <laughs> the thing about about army life is that is it, it it has a certain agelessness to it. It has a certain uh, throughout the ages, it remains the same. It changes, yet it remains the same. That's why you can pick up a a novel of the Civil War of seven guys in a platoon, and it has great relevancy. Well, because they're involved in the same thing. It's, it's basically a senseless, uh, meaningless activity. Uh, it's, it's an activity, it's basically a negative activity. Let's face it, what is war? It's meaningless and it's negative. Do you agree with that? And here you are, you're prepared for it. And, and uh, so you get, you get all these men together, and men remain men. If you get seven uh, cavemen together, there must have been seven or eight cavemen very early in man's evolution, squatting outside of a cave, and, and the first dirty joke was told, uh, <laughs> which set the whole tenor of it. And, and uh, it became, you know, because it was right. So, uh, nevertheless, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dragging down to the company street, little realizing that it's about to be one of those moments that I will forget never in my life. We get into the early room, and Kowalski comes out from behind the, uh, the swinging door. Now, we had this little fence. Uh, all orderly rooms have a certain classic quality to them. Uh, John, may I interrupt you for a moment? I, I, I maintain that all orderly rooms have a certain classic quality to them. Do you agree with this? With the little fence, the swinging gate? Nevertheless, out from behind comes Kowalski. And Kowalski says, all right, he said, I want all you guys. He says, how many of you guys here have pole line experience. Well, we were immediately very suspicious. This was the signal corps. Now, all guys who went into the signal corps and uh, went through the, the entire training of the signal corps had pole line experience. Now, a lot of you see things in your life that you don't even think much about, but it contains a whole... What's going on? Are we having problems in there? No trouble? Okay, I just see a lot of activity. People yelling, phones ringing, all that. Okay, it's all right? Nothing's burning. All right. I wish it were once in a while. Get a little excitement around here. But uh, nevertheless, when he said that, how many of you guys got pole line in the experience? You do not ever admit in the Army, unless you get a further clue as to what it's about, you don't admit to anything. I, one of the classic stories, of course, is, 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 a, is a guy standing out in front of a platoon saying, how many of you guys can type? And instantly, five guys figure their head, you know, up goes the hand. Uh, I can type, figuring he's going to be, he uh, got this groovy job typing someplace. You know, it's going to be nice and quiet. He says, okay, all you five guys that can type, all you guys go down to the consolidated mess hall now. They need seven guys down there. You know, it's a way of, of euchring you. Have you ever seen that done, John? All right, it, it, it's actually done. So don't tell me nothing. <laughs> oh, yes, this is human beings. So... He said, how many of you guys got pole line construction experience? Now, every last one of us did, and he knew it. All he's got to do is look at your Form 32. He knows what you got. There's no way you can fake it. So he asked his sister, and he says, what do you think? We were so bored. At that point, we had been for over 32 months standing next to this radar set, which just kept sweeping over our heads. Endlessly sweeping, endlessly making a 440 cycle note. I said, okay, Gazzy. And Elkins looking down to the three of us, me and Gazzy, Zensmeister, looks down. And the Kowalski says, all right, he says, okay, so you six, seven guys, you sound like you guys from the end, you six guys. He said, I want you to show up here tomorrow at 0800. 0800. And I mean 0800. They have not changed Army time. 0800, I want you right here in front of the orderly room at 0800. I want you in helmet, fatigues, leggings, web belt, cartridge belt. I want you to wear your canteens. 
And I want you to be ready for business. And oh, by the way, bring your leather gloves. Leather gloves? What the hell is this? <laughs> what the hell is this? Please? The rain comes out. So, and, and immediately, Gaston says, what's it for? He says, none of your damn business. Out in the street we go. We had volunteered for a secret mission that requires leather gloves. They <laughs> wonder what it is. Please. Well, now, when you're, when you run into, to, uh, each, each branch of the service has different equipment that is uh, issued to it when you go in. And one, several branches have different types of gloves. You never see the gloves that are, you were issued gloves, right? When you went in, okay. Now, that's correct. Now, now, we were both, all of us were issued two sets of leather gloves. They're kind of yellowish, brownish, yellowish, heavy gloves. These are not yellow, these are not elegant uh, uh, leather. There's one, yes, there was one dress pair of gloves, sort of. <laughs> they didn't call them dress. But uh, these, are, these are leather gloves with a gauntlet-like, and that heavy gauntlet thing. So we go back to the, to the tent, and Gaston says, I don't like this. And Zinsmeister says, well, what the hell, you know, what, what can they do? I mean, they can only shoot us or something. That's, uh, what, 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 how far can they go? And Gaston says, I don't know, I don't like this. I don't like the sound of them yellow gloves, those, those leather gloves. <laughs> So we began to dig in. I, I take out. I hadn't had my gloves out for a while. I didn't even remember where they were, you know. So I, I go back into my barracks bag, uh, and you know the bead bag has a whole lot of stuff that drifts down to the bottom of it. Stuff that you ever use, you know, it's way down the bottom. Like I never wore my long johns ever, you know, but they were down at the bottom. See, all the stuff that you need once in a while when they have a full field inspection, you drag that junk out. And so I start digging down, and sure enough, I find my gloves, which were still. You know, real, real, uh, you could smell them, you know, they were, they were brand new yet. Full of damn things, huh? Little did I realize how they would be at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to give you a clue as to what happened, but that night, uh, we lay in the sack there, and all of us, you know, we had a pyramidal tent, you know, six of us there, we're talking about this thing. Now, all six of us were going on this dynamic mission, and it's the kind of stuff you just don't see in the movies. What happened the next day, uh, I hesitate to even tell you because you probably won't believe it. It's simply, uh, most, most true secret missions are unbelievable. And nobody writes movies about unbelievable things. So, <laughs> 0800, immediately following Chow, we have had our usual oatmeal and our, and our little box, they put a little box of Wheaties, you know, or, or cereal, a little box of cereal, upside down on the bowl and all that. We had our breakfast and the GI coffee. And there was always rumors that they were putting stuff in a GI coffee. Uh, this this rumor persisted constantly. It had to do with virility and everything. And, and uh, that rumor was disproved a thousand times. But the rumor would blow up again. Somebody would say, hey, you know what they're putting in that? And you say, no kidding. Oh, come on, that's bug. And so we're sitting there waiting in front of the, in front of the orderly room. And out comes Kowalski. And around the corner... Comes this little troop carrier. Just comes right around the corner, you know, to come with the benches and back. Brrr, he comes around the corner, right on a dot, 0800, see? And Kowalski is out there, and he saw it. He said, I don't know where you guys are going. He said, oh, nothing about it. He says, but you're going to an airfield. An airfield? He says, you're going to an airfield, and I've been instructed to pick six guys that know what the hell they're doing and know a hell of a lot about wire. And according to your form 32s, you guys know a lot about wire. You know a lot about pole light construction. And I picked you six guys. And if anybody asks you, if you get to that damn bear field, and anybody asks you how you come to be there, you tell them you volunteered. Are there any questions? Because if it comes back that they say that I picked you, man, there's going to be a hell of a lot of stuff flying around this company. So any questions? You are volunteers, right? Well, in the way we were. You know, after all, we went down there. They came and they asked us. We didn't. Now, I'm, I'm not doing the same old army story about being, you know, you, 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 you volunteer. No, no. We really did volunteer. This taught me something about volunteering, by the way, which I have never forgotten. I don't volunteer anymore. I mean, now you're, you're looking at a non-volunteer. You're looking at a guy that has to get drafted for everything. 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 If somebody comes in and says, quick, we need a volunteer. The boss is laying out there. He can't breathe. I say, oh, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. The volunteer, not me. And anyway, we got into the truck. And we got our gloves. <laughs> What's with the gloves, see? And so we, we, nobody else is in the truck, just us six. 
and the driver and a guy sitting next to the driver who was a captain. And the captain says nothing. He just looks back out, he counts the guys, and he gets back into the truck, and away we go. And we go popping, hopping out of the, right out of, out of the post, past the, it past the MPs, down through the woods, through the swamps, over the sand dunes, mile after mile over gravel roads, past all kinds of bad news scenes, past the quartermaster dumps, everything. We're going on and on and on. We started at 0800. It is now quarter after 12 already, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, it's, 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 we've been on the road for four hours, and uh, we're just going and going and going. And suddenly the truck stops. Just slows to a stop, and the captain looks in the back. See, we're sitting there, and he says, he says, time for chow. And with that, he throws us six cans of sea rashes. He just throws it back in. <laughs> the captain says, wait, wait a minute. He says, time for chow. We don't have no time to mess around. He says, eat it on the way. So, away we go again. Now, these are cans. You've seen the cans, right? Oh, they're delicious, I'll tell you. You just get so that you like it real much, I'll tell you. And you don't know what you're getting, see? So he just throws the six back, and what do I catch? I catch, <laughs> when I think about it, I catch peas and veal. Now, they have these crazy combinations, like peas and veal, uh, like uh, eggs eggs and mushrooms. Uh, have you ever had canned mushrooms and canned eggs, friend? It's fantastic. So I got the, I got the peas and the veal. So... <laughs> <laughs> I opened the damn thing up. You know what? My, you, 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 did, you know, of course, you get a trench knife in the army, right? So here it is. It's on, the, on my belt, and I said, I opened it up. So I'm eating the peas and veal. And I said, What do you got, Gasser? He said, I got, I got barbecue turkey, it says. And I said, What the hell? I never saw that one. He said, Yeah, it's barbecue turkey and ox tongue. I said, No kidding. So, he, <laughs> so we're rolling. <laughs> and this goes on. It's now about, oh, maybe, uh, mm, quick. Quick, quick, I'll give you time. Quick, quick, quick. What's 1300? There you go. 1300. It's about 1340, roughly. When the truck slews up, and we could see out there a great big field, fantastic field, and there's a bunch of planes drawn up out there, and you could see the hangars in the distance. And we are in the, you know, all of a sudden it's the airport, see? So we pile up, and the captain says, Follow me, you guys. So we go through the gate, and he's got a pass. And he just shows this guy this stuff. And he says, come on, you guys. He says, let's, let's, let's dress up that line there a little bit. And he's very G.I. type. He says, dress up the line. And he says, I don't want to hear any talk. He says, let's move on. So we just go trot. And he says, all right, now let's, let's, let's do a little double time, you guys. So we go trotting along. Absolutely a cool character. This guy did not say, hello, fellows. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Captain Murchison. None of that stuff. I mean, he just straight, you know, you know this kind of officer? Absolutely straight point. He says, all right, come on, let's go. How many times? We're late already. So we go double timing. We go running along a concrete road, and we did not know have any idea. And all the while, these planes are going over. You <whistles> plane goes over. It's <whistles> very exciting. This, this is totally different from what we thought we were going to be involved in. And it was a very mysterious-looking crowd. Into a hangar we go. Just charts us into a hangar, and his captain. He just uh, he was an Air Force captain. You know, he just traps us into the hangar. And uh, he says, all right, you guys, wait right here. So we stand inside the door, and he walks across this gigantic, echoing hangar, fantastic hangar. And sitting in the hangar was an airplane, all by itself. No other no thing around, just this airplane. And he said, uh, you wait here. So he goes across the hangar, under the, under the wing of the plane, he goes to the back, and he comes back out with about seven guys. And, I mean, they're dressed up. I mean, they got the whole thing on, you know, with the big, big... Big hat with the with the big uh, shades that come down in the front and all that stuff, and and with that the the one who apparently was in charge was a major. He comes over to us and he stands and looks at us. And he's wearing a zippered coverall. He's got leaves on each shoulder. He looks up down. He says, uh, "He said, uh, what's your name?" And the guy says, "Zinsmeister." Zinsmeister. He said, uh, "Corporal, huh? Uh, you wire man." Since Francis says, well, none of us were. See, that's, we had just had one brief 90-day period when we were trained. We hadn't done this for years, you know. Uh, since I said, well, no, he says, you, 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 it's on your Form 32, your wiremen. Are you guys wiremen? Yeah. Okay. So come on, you got to draw your equipment. Draw equipment? What are we drawing? Well, we go trotting under the wing of the plane. It's a fantastic plane. We go under the body of the plane. And they're weeding it now out of the hangar. 
We go down around the back and they had a cage built in the side of the hangar where they were handing out equipment. They gave us each an orange coverall with a zipper. <laughs> One of these big helmets <laughs> with the sweat thing comes down. <laughs> it went back to sweat. And, and at that point, the, the, the guy behind the screen says, you got your own gloves, I see. Good. What the hell's with the gloves? So each one of us had our zipper thing on, and we all had our gloves, and the, the, the major tracks us out, and now we are out in the field. We follow the airplane out, which is being pushed out by about 17 guys, towed by nine little yellow jeeps, and the whole bit. They get this there, huge airplane, fantastic airplane. They get us out on the, on the runway, and they tow the airplane down to the far end of the field. We must have walked two miles in... Uh, route step, roughly. And we get out there in the plane, and the Major says, all right, man. It's a highly confidential mission. You men have been specially selected for it, for your proficiency with Signal Corps PL-33, 19, and 72 wire. This is your aircraft. This is an experimental mission, and it is a new system for laying wire in combat. A new system for laying wire in combat. Now, wire in combat, there was a thing that we once heard about where they drove along in a Jeep, and they had a big rail. Did you ever see them do this? And they laid us wires, they drive like hell. Well, what is this sticking with the airplane? With the airplane? He says, now... You will be instructed by the sergeant in the interior of the aircraft as to how the winch and the rear works. There will be no, I repeat, there will be no discussion of this experiment immediately following the completion. Now, all of you know how to work a PL-33 winch and a PL-33 reel. We all had this like two years before. It's a reel that has a break on it. And one by one, we climbed up into the airplane, which was totally gutted. The aircraft had nothing in it. There were no seats. You ever been in a big airplane with no seats in it? It's a very interesting experience. With no uh, insulation inside, it's just an, a, a shell, a big giant that looks like the interior. Well, it actually looks like a tunnel in the, in the uh, subway, roughly. Nothing in it. Except right in the middle of the floor, in the deck, is this gigantic reel of signal core wire and an enormous system of, of brakes and, and it looks like pulleys and all kinds of buttons and, and we could see it is sitting next to what looked like a big sliding trap door and on either side of the trap door are two wooden runways just laid down on the floor with straps that came out of the side that apparently were for hooking up a parachute or some damn thing. So we get into the airplane. We're all standing looking at this. And outside, we can see the plane is now being wheeled around. And oh, it starts to tumble. We're, we're going, man. We are now taxiing across the, the tarmac over over the weeds. We're on the runway, and we are about to take off. And the sergeant says, all right, men, watch me. I will demonstrate the equipment as we take off. It is a very simple and straightforward system of laying wire from an aircraft flying at an altitude of between 300 and 350 feet. That way we stay under radar and we get under fighter protection and we can lay wire it with great dispatch. This is merely a test. We have never really tested this equipment, but the theory is sound and we know it'll work. And now we are in the air. And we're going just low over trees. We can see there's little tiny bulkhead windows. We can see the trees outside. And a little red light goes on in the pier. Ah, Sergeant, over the target area, over the target area. It's coming up at the count of three. Zero, one, two, three. <laughs> the door wheels back, and we're looking down at the ground, which is going by us at 200 miles an hour. Have you ever looked right down at the ground going by? And I'm standing on the edge of a cliff. The sergeant says, all right, men, watch this. And he reaches the button up. He says, now, here we go. You pull this one down, and then at the count of six, the ratchet number four, which is this ratchet, will be dislodged this way. 
down goes the parachute, and the wire starts going out. Suddenly there's a clunk. The entire witch, the reel, all of it jerks up by the roots. Down it goes, right out the bottom of the plane. The bottom of the plane is yanked out. The plane stops in midair. Oh, my God, we're crashing. The lieutenant who's driving a plane says, What the hell's going on back there? The sergeant says, Lieutenant, I don't know what. It's hooked up. I can't fix it. Ten minutes later, we're on the ground. The lieutenant says, Never mention it again. I have just broken confidence. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation.